corruption in Denmark. Um, this graph shows the number of officials who were convicted of fraud in the last 200 years. So you can see that you actually had a big drop in 1850. Um, bec um, you all know the story of Robin Hood? Sorry. The story of Robin Hood? Yeah. The sheriff of Nottingham, he was actually stealing from the people. He, he gave some of it to the king, but he kept a lot of it for himself. Uh, so we, what happened was that we actually had two kings who were tired of their officials stealing from them. So they made some uh, reforms, penal code, that it would be criminal uh, to accept bribes. But also important, they had a pay reform for civil servants. Uh, because it is often seen as an excuse that if you're a public official and you have a very low salary that you cannot live on, what should you do? So actually, he started making sure that the officials had didn't have that excuse anymore, so they actually uh, got a fair pay. Um, we also, he also introduced freedom of the press, which is also important for transparency, because if you can write about public officials, then all of a sudden it, be it becomes more risky to be corrupt. Uh, he introduced uh, pensions and audits Audits is also an important uh, thing. So we have, uh, I'm sure you have as well a, a government audit office that uh, audit the, the state's uh, books. Um, and they will certainly also be one of the elements that uh, can detect corruption. So we were, we were a corrupt country until the middle of the 19th century. We had these changes, uh, which actually made sort of a big bang on corruption. You saw the dramatic drop in the number of officials that were actually convicted of uh, corruption. So we believe that some of the things that put us where we are, and I would like to stress, we are not perfect. We think we're doing pretty good, but there are some things that we need to fix. Uh, typically, in Denmark, we trust people. Our Im immediate reaction is to trust people and not to, to start being afraid. Or so. If somebody asks you, what time is it? You don't start by saying, what do you need that for? Why do you ask me? Are you trying to do something to me? You say, well, it's 10.15 uh, or, or whatever. So we, we start out by trusting people doesn't mean that we are dumb and we will always trust them, but our initial action is trust. We have a high sense of justice, that is, everyone is equal before the law. Denmark is probably also one of the most, what you would call, egalitarian societies. Um, and actually, this house is, uh, was founded by one of the uh, giants of Denmark, he was uh, called uh, Nikolai Grundvi, and he was a free thinker, and he actually uh, had many of the thoughts that make Denmark what we are today. And one of, the, one of his songs, he wrote that he would like to see a country where few had too little and fewer had too much. I think that's uh, pervasive of how uh, we think of uh, equality in Denmark. We believe that we have an enforcement of, of a anti-corruption legislation that, that everyone accepts. We do not like people to steal from the public covers. We have a reasonable, if not necessarily high, but we have an absolutely reasonable level of pay for public officials. Um, and we have an open, a uh, society with a very free press. So that means that basically, if you're corrupt, you have a very big risk of detection. But there's something still to be done.
A couple of years ago, Transparency International, which is the global headquarters, is in Berlin. They made an agreement with the European Union to perform what is called national integrity studies in all of the EU countries. Uh, so basically, the EU has paid for this study. Uh, there's also been a lot of voluntary work put in in the various countries. Um, so this study resulted for Denmark in this book, which is called the National Integrity Study. Uh, unfortunately, it is in Danish, but I'd be very happy to... We are actually in the process of making a compact English version, and I'd be happy to share that with you. What I can share with you and put on the stick, that is the formal methodology behind the study, because in principle you could apply the same study to your or to any other country. It's not Europe specific or anything. But what it does is that it deals with what we call the pillars of integrity. And I should also say that TI in Berlin, they were actually doing a review on the site to make sure that all the uh, studies in the 27 countries were balanced uh, because, I mean, you could either be tempted to paint a rosy picture of your country or you could be tempted to make paint a black country. Uh, it was interesting because we actually had the final review meeting uh, here in Marto and we had invited some political parties and there was also, I remember one said, I don't like the picture you paint. Denmark is very uncorrupt and if this get out, that we have these pillars that don't quite reach the ceiling, that will give a very bad impression. So he was sort of on the side to say, well, we are, we are among the best in the world. Why, why should we tell anybody, anybody about our dirty laundry? Do you think these are all specific to certain cultures, like the Protestant ethic, you know, the Lutheran values? This is possible. You know, Asia is so phenomenally covered. We've been covered for 5,000 years. These are cultural practices. Maybe to do business with you, our companies can adopt something. I think we, we have been just as corrupt. Yes. But, but I think there are some things that uh, started, for instance, I think that Martin Luther hmm. sought of the Catholic Church is very corrupt. Yes. I mean, the, I think corruption is also when you uh, sell absolution. Yes. If you yes. give me uh, yes. one golden <laughs> dollar, then your soul will forever be uh, in heaven. It would be very easy for me as a white Caucasian to say, well, the Asians are just corrupt. They are born corrupt and they will die corrupt. Nothing can be done about it. The same with Latin America and Africa. That's just in their genes. But history shows that it's not so. It's possible to, to change, but it's, it's a lot of hard work. I think if we actually look back on the motives of this king, because not only did he uh, make the law uh, that banned uh, or criminalized corruption, but he was actually also the one who moved from uh, royalty to a democratic constitution and that happened in 1849 that's when we got our current institution i think he was actually tired of being the omnipotent uh, god-given king of a country and said well i don't think this is right we need to move another way so this one of the components was the fight against corruption uh, another was actually a move towards democracy. That it's nobody really understands the economic scale of corruption. Uh, various you have a lot of um, civil society organizations that look at various concepts, but just like nobody has the right number for say the trade of narcotics in the world or uh, tax evasion. You can get some indicators. Uh, I'd like to show you. He's saying that nobody has an idea 
of the economic scale of corruption. That is also very important for us because every audit report says this is five hundred thousand billion dollars is raised to two hundred thousand. Yes, please continue. So uh, here are some of the key resources that I at least found some very good information in. Uh, there's Transparency Org, which is the central uh, global office in Berlin. There's Transparency DK, but I don't think your Danish is so good that you get a lot out of it. Uh, then there's an organization called Global Financial Integrity. And one of the things that they look very much at is what they call illicit financial flows. So for instance, uh, they just came out with a report, uh, I don't have the numbers for India, but saying that China lost three trillion dollars in illicit outflows. So simply money that rich Chinese in sent. Illicit? In illicit? Illicit uh, financial outflow. So outflow. So that's tax evasion. Uh, it's both tax evasion, it's also capital flight. I mean, I'm sure that those three trillion dollars could go, do a lot of good in China. I mean, it's, uh, there must be a lot of people that could use some of them. I don't have them in it, but if you check, I'm sure you can find the numbers for India there. So I think that's really, uh, so I've subscribed to the newsletter. I think it's very valuable. Um, then there is OECD that uh, made an anti-bribery convention where the signatory countries, they have committed to make it illegal for companies from their country to bribe public officials in other countries. So it would be illegal for a Danish company to bribe an official in India to try to uh, get a business advantage. But it's on the Danish company is working for a defense contract in India or in any, any other country. So how do they, how, how they go about it? So sometimes it becomes necessary for them to pay. That's an interesting question. I mean, you could, uh, because that some some businesses would say, well, we need to bribe because it's part of the Indian culture, and if you want to sell anything there, that's what we need. What what we need to do. Um, but it's actually illegal, uh, and it's illegal in all of the OECD countries. And there are some new countries that have signed uh, as well. Um, so so I think that's a good news. Uh, China and India are not yet signatories, so I don't know if, if it would be illegal there or not. But it would be illegal for a Danish or an American or a Russian or a German company to bribe a public official in Germany. In, in, anywhere in the world or just in the OECD countries? All over the world. Okay. But this is for, this implies for the private companies as well? Yes, if a private company will bribe an official Public. In a public official in another country. But, uh, there's uh, the question of enforcement. Um, so TI actually makes an annual evaluation of the OECD countries of whether they actually enforce the convention in their countries. And there's a uh, I can put that on the stick as well. Uh, so, and it shows that there's some countries that are very active in enforcement, and those countries are uh, uh, United States, Germany, UK, Italy, Switzerland, Norway, and Denmark. So these are the countries where we, we measure by the number of cases that are raised and convictions. We judge from that whether they are active. And then we have uh, countries that have no enforcement. I mean, that, I mean, they signed the treaty, the convention, but they're not really doing anything about it. Uh, so there would be, for instance, Estonia, New Zealand, Greece, Israel, South Africa, Czech Republic, Poland, and Ireland. They're not really living up to their obligations. 
Now, if somebody wants to move the country from high level of corruption to a low level or to, towards a high level of uh, transparency, these are some of the things that, that you need to be aware of. First of all, uh, everyone knows you cannot uh, make a big jump on the corruption index from one year to another. It takes time because there are a lot of people that are involved in corruption and to believe that you can actually change it from Monday to Tuesday is not. But you need to pretend that you can actually make it happen. But one of the key things uh, is to have an adequate legislation. I mean, if you can get a good legislation, you can get uncorrupt courts, you can get uncorrupt police force. Uh, those are really the key steps on the road away from corruption. You need to have severe punishment of violations. And then of course you can have international pressure in various ways. Uh, you can have international stakeholders 